Welcome to discipleship class number 12. It's going to be 12 now. Discipleship class number 12. In discipleship class number 11, I taught you about the balance and attributes of God, and you're going to listen to all four parts. Now, in this class is three particular subjects. We're first going to go through the humanity of Christ. The humanity of Christ. So, this is one of the doctrines in Christology, Christology, the study of Christ. And in the study of Christ, we're going to see how our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his human nature. There are some things that are taught wrong in churches, actually, concerning Christ's humanity. And only Bible believers will teach this certain part in this doctrine, actually, which I'm going to show you. The other parts is basically foundational, basic doctrines that you should know. Okay, the first part, let's talk about his virgin birth. His virgin birth. So Jesus Christ was born from a virgin. That is proven in several passages. <clears throat> we see that Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, he is child born. Child born. And that equals a human. Then it shows son is given. Son is given. That equals God who cannot be born since he's eternal. So in Isaiah 9, 6, it shows the humanity and the deity side. And then Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, was a prophecy of Christ being a human. That's a scriptural certainty in Isaiah 7, 14. We also have a problem here that if Jesus was humanly born, then he's born with sin. And that's proven as Psalms chapter 51 verse 5 and chapter 58 verse 3. Those two passages show the dilemma that if Christ was humanly born, he's born with sin. That's why the passages of Isaiah will be, will be important to show his deity side, that he's not full human. Modernism is a heretical teaching. What modernism is, is that they do believe in Jesus, but they just believe he's a good teacher, that he's a human. Now, that's prevalent in all public schools and universities. But we believe that he is deity. We believe that he is deity. In Leviticus chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 19 through 21, Matthew chapter 1, verse 19 through 21, and Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. Those two passages prove Joseph knew Mary was pregnant before marriage. So that is definite proof that Jesus was not just a human, that he ha definitely has deity in him. Joseph sexually knew Mary before. Uh, Joseph knew that Mary was pregnant before he sexually knew her. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, it proves that he had no sexual relations before Jesus' birth. Mary had no sex. Luke chapter 1, verse 34 through 35, Mary questioned the angel how she's going to give birth without sex. So all these verses are evidences, loaded with evidences against modernism. So th these verses are definite proof that Jesus Christ, he was born not just as a human, but he is deity as well. He is deity. Here's an interesting fact. Luke chapter 1, Luke was a medical physician. Yet he believed in the virgin birth. How about that? He's a medical doctor, so he should know that, as a matter of fact, that women cannot give birth without sexual relations. But yet he believed in the virgin birth, a medical doctor. So we know that this virgin birth is a real thing. Otherwise, Luke would not have written that as a medical doctor. John chapter 8, verse 41, as well as verse 39. John chapter 8, verse 41 and verse 39. The Pharisees knew that Joseph was not Jesus' father. They accused him of actually being an illegitimate child. So look at that. Even the people, the enemies of Jesus during his days, realized that Joseph was not Jesus' father, that there was something else going on. Jesus proved that God is his father. That's proven at Matthew 22, 41 through 46. Luke chapter 2, 48 through 50. 
Now, here are some wrong ideas about the humanity of Christ or his virgin birth. Here are some wrong ideas that you want to mark down. This is where several wrong doctrines are birthed. <clears throat> some wrong ideas. One is concerning uh, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. So that's one of it. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, remember it says, A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. Well, in your liberal universities, they'll claim that it is young woman, not literally virgin, because they want to deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. But that doesn't make sense. Why would Isaiah give a dumb prophecy like, Look, there's a young, virgin, there's a young woman who's going to bring forth a son. Well, duh, anyone knows that. So that doesn't sound like a big prophecy right there, unless you say virgin. The proof is Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew 1, verse 23 proves that it has to be virgin. You know why? Okay, liberal scholars will argue that Isaiah 7, 14, al uh, alma mater means young woman, not literally virgin. But if you look at Matthew 1, 23, you can't go around that. That Greek word, parthenos, is literally is translated virgin. It's never young woman. Never young woman. And Matthew 1.23 was quoting Isaiah 7.14. So when the New Testament writer was quoting Isaiah 7.14, he knew it was literally a virgin, not just a young woman. Catholicism teaches that Mary was always a virgin. But how you debunk that is the book of Mark chapter 6 verse 3. So this is a second wrong idea. Mark chapter 6, verse 3, Matthew chapter 1, verse 24 through 25. It proves Jesus had siblings, so G Mary was not always a virgin. Another wrong idea. Some people claim Paul never stated about the virgin birth, but that's baloney. If you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 3, so that's the third wrong idea. If you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 3, Paul said that Christ was born in the flesh. So Paul even knew about this. The fourth wrong idea about the virgin birth is Mormonism. Now look at Luke chapter, uh, you can write down Luke chapter 24 and verse 39. The fourth wrong idea is according to Mormonism, God had sex with Mary to give birth to Jesus. So believe it or not, they actually teach that. But that is baloney because then God would lie about Jesus being virgin born then. Jesus has to be virgin born. In fact, for Christ's birth, a spirit cannot have sex. If you look at Luke chapter 24, verse 39, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit obviously cannot have sexual relations. So that's the fourth wrong idea. The fifth wrong idea is concerning science. Now, obviously, science does not believe in this. That's why they say that it's a fairy tale, that Jesus Christ was virgin born. But write down 1 Timothy 3.16, as well as Luke chapter 12, verse 8, as well as John chapter 10 and verse 36. If you look at these three passages, the Bible says, 1 Timothy 3.16, God is manifest in the flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. See that? So obviously science can't explain it because science is understanding the study of the physical universe. This, 1 Timothy 3.16 told you, it has nothing to do with this physical world. So obviously you can't test it by a test tube. God is doing something outside of the physical natural realm. Luke 12 verse 8 says that Jesus Christ is son of man, thus proving he's born through Mary. John 10 36 shows that Jesus is son of God, thus born through God the Father. Thus this proves Jesus Christ has deity and humanity together. So this solves a controversy concerning attacks against his humanity and deity. Now, the relationship of the Son to the Father. Let's talk about that one. So that's the next idea. The relationship of the Son to the Father.
Now, there are attacks against the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at some of these passages that will be helpful. Christ lowered his position in becoming a man. This is why he is lower than God the Father. So when there are Jehovah Witnesses and cults that say, well, Jesus Christ is not God. Jesus Christ is a lesser God because if you compare the Son, the Son is always subservient, lesser than the Father. Well, the verses show that Christ lowered his position. Why? To become a man. When you're a man, you're lowered. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 through 7, and verse 9. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 6. Not only that, here's our obvious verses. Jesus Christ is known to be the Son, right? The Son. Now, in the Bible, who is higher? Father or Son? In a natural, physical relationship. It's the Father, right? So if you have the Son right here, in a natural physical relationship, isn't the son always subservient to the father? The Bible says, children, obey your parents. Honor thy father. Correct? So that's why when Jesus Christ calls himself the son, it should be common since he's subservient to the father. So these are proven at John chapter 14, verse 28. John chapter 5, verse 19. John chapter 10, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Luke chapter 22, verse 29, and John chapter 20, verse 17. Not only that, Jesus Christ calls himself man in these passages. Man, 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 man. Now, when we hear son of God versus son of man, the words God versus man, who's obviously higher, God or man? God. So when Jesus Christ calls himself son of man, obviously that's a subservient position. Otherwise, he is higher than God the Father. So here's the idea. The idea is the form of man obviously is not equal to the form of God. Thus, he's subservient. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27 through 28 proves the Son is always subservient to the Father. He's always subservient to the Father. In fact, John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 16 it says, begotten son. That means that God did not give birth to Christ. Nowhere in the Bible does it show that, except the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus Christ through the Virgin Mary. So when it says begotten son, that doesn't mean that Jesus Christ is a created being, like some cults will teach. It says begotten son. Begotten son through what? The deity side or the humanity side? Humanity side. So this teaching is important, the relationship of the Son to the Father. If you understand that, then this is useful against the cults who teach that Jesus is a lesser God, that he is not God himself. Why? Because there are passages where Jesus is subservient. Well, the easy explanation to that is because Jesus, what? He has two natures, full God and full human. See that? With his full human side, that's why He's subservient because it's focusing on his humanity side. But when you focus on his deity side, you'll see that Jesus Christ is equated with the Father. In what? Deity side. Jesus is as much God as the Father is God. But then in the humanity side, you'll see subservience, subservience, subservience. So the cults are only focusing on one nature. See, his deity side. But no, we're looking at his humanity side and his deity side. Rightly dividing is a basic doctrine. You rightly divide two natures. Jesus Christ is not just one nature. He's two natures. Okay, now we're going to talk about Christ's humanity now. In his humanity, Jesus Christ, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 through 16, Hebrews chapter, 4, verse 6, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 through 16. His humanity is important because Jesus does know what it's like to be human. Thus, he can sympathize with our weaknesses and our pains. That's why it's a blessing. After all, he took the worst temptation from the greatest tempter, did he not? At Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. So he truly understands. He did that for 40 days without a bite or a drink. 
Now, with Christ, humani uh, with Christ humanity, he obviously had a human ancestry. There are so many verses to prove this. Luke chapter 2, verse 7, he has a human ancestry. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, he has a human ancestry. Luke chapter 1, verse 23 through 28, he has a human ancestry. Now, Jesus Christ definitely took upon a physical nature. There's no doubt about that. He placed the physical nature upon himself. To say that Jesus Christ does not have a human nature, you are blatantly wrong. He has a human nature. These are proven at John chapter 1, verse 14, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, as well as Matthew chapter 26, verse 12. Matthew 26, verse 12. Now, Here's something also important that Jesus Christ was subject to laws of human development. Okay, now that's very important to understand. Jesus Christ was subject to laws of human development. So when you see verses where Jesus was tired, where you see other verses where Jesus grew in knowledge, that doesn't mean that Jesus is not God. That doesn't mean that Jesus, your God, is stupid. It's because of his... Look, this teaching is very important because it sh explains, it stresses on his humanity side. People forget his humanity side. They only focus on his deity to prove that Jesus is a weaker being, that he is not God. But that's the problem. We're, this subject is not the deity of Christ. This subject is about the humanity of Christ. Remember, he has two natures, not one. He's not just fully God, he's fully human. To make him 50% human, and 50% God doesn't work. He's 100% God, 100% human. So these verses are going to show why Jesus Christ, he is subject to laws of human development. That doesn't mean he's weaker. Luke chapter 2 verse 40 shows that he grew. Luke chapter 2 verse 46 shows he asked questions. Luke chapter 2 verse 52 shows he increased in wisdom. He increased in wisdom. You got to realize this. Use some common sense. Do you think when Jesus Christ was born in a manger, he started to s s critique on Einstein's theory of relativity? Or did he cry like a baby and was not able to talk at that time? Use some common sense right here. When Jesus Christ was born from Mary's womb, he wasn't going, one plus one equals two. Didn't you know that? Crying out loud, man. He learned obedience. He learned obedience. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. He suffered. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. He worked as a carpenter. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. He hungered. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. Now, have you ever seen the, these atheists pulling up these passages where Jesus Christ was hungry, Jesus Christ was thirsty? Oh, so he can't be God? Ridiculous nonsense. Again, we're not focusing on his deity here. We're focusing on his humanity. He thirsted, John chapter 4, verse 7. He was tired. Yes, Jesus was tired. John chapter 4, verse 6. Oh, he can't be God because he fell asleep. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. These guys, they don't have... They've, they've got rocks for brains, man. Jesus Christ slept, Matthew chapter 8, verse 24. Jesus Christ, he loved, Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Jesus wept. Now, that should be touching. Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus prayed, Matthew 14, verse 23. Jesus prayed, Matthew 14, verse 23. Oh, how can God pray to God? That doesn't make sense. Blah, 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 blah. You got to realize this. He was in his human nature at that moment. And at human nature, he can pray to God, the Father. All right, the sinlessness of Christ. Okay, now this one is where... A lot of people mess up in doctrine. Only Bible believers teach this. So this is something extremely important. Even independent fundamental Baptists mess up on this. Okay. Now what I mean by this is, let me give you this teaching. This is important to understand. First of all, we got to understand how sinless Jesus Christ was. The description of how sinless he was is proven at John chapter 17 verse 4, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Now, there are testimonies to Christ's sinlessness. Now, this is extremely powerful. 
There are testimonies in Jesus' lifetime that he was sinless. So if these people during Jesus' lifetime prove that he's sinless, this proves Jesus is not just a man, that these people saw Jesus as God. So you could probably use these verses on Muslims too. So this will be powerful. Okay, his birth is a testimony. Acts chapter 4, verse 27 and verse 30. Devils believed he was sinless. Devils. Luke chapter 4, verse 34. If Muslims don't believe Jesus is God, I'll tell you devils do. Pilate even believed. John chapter 18, verse 38. Pilate, Roman. The thief on the cross realized it. Luke chapter 23, verse 41. The woman also recognized it. A sinful woman. Matthew chapter 27, verse 19. Matthew 27, 19. The centurion relented and believed Jesus Christ is God. Luke chapter 23, verse 47. Or at least he has deity as son of God. Not only that, Jesus himself testified his own sinlessness. See Mohammed doing that. See any prophet doing that. Joseph Smith. No prophet in their right mind would blatantly say that unless they are connected to deity. John chapter 8, verse 46. John 8, 46. Not only that, the Bible is the greatest testimony to, to Jesus' sinlessness. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 22. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Hebrews 4, 15. 1 John 3, 3. Okay, now here's the problem that a lot of people have errors, okay, even independent fundamental Baptists. So here are wrong ideas about Jesus' sinlessness. Concerning Jesus' sinlessness, a lot of Baptist preachers, they will say that Jesus Christ cannot be tempted to sin. Could Jesus sin? No, there's no way Jesus could ever sin, that Jesus was capable to sin. Well, Bible believers teach that Jesus Christ, he could have been capable. He had the ability to sin. Now, why is that the case? Because of Jesus Christ being 100% human, you understand. Now, because Jesus Christ is 100% God, that's what they're going to focus on. And they're going to focus on that, that it's impossible that Jesus could have sinned. But here's the idea. So let's cover this issue. The first issue is this. How can a perfect person be tempted to sin, right? Jesus was a perfect person. So there's no way he could have been tempted to sin. No, that's wrong. Adam and Eve, weren't they perfect people? Perfect state. Yet they were what? Tempted to sin. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and verse 31. Not only that, Jesus Christ himself said at Matthew 19, verse 17, Jesus Christ even himself said that he is not good. Why callest thou me good? There is none but good but God. Now, does that mean that Jesus Christ said that he's a sinner? No, because if you look at verse 16, this is important to note because there are critics who will use this verse that Jesus Christ himself said he's not good. If you look at the verse behind it, the rich young ruler called him good master. What things shall I do to inherit eternal life? The rich young ruler, do you think he saw Jesus as God or man? Man. He didn't see him as God Almighty himself. He saw him as man. So because the rich young ruler saw Jesus as man, Jesus, when he was giving that answer, he was focusing on his human nature. That human nature, no, no one is perfect. No one is sinless. Only what? He said God. So in God nature, God's the only one that's good. So that's important to note because Jesus Christ is fully God, which so showing he cannot sin, but he also had a human nature that's 100%. So Satan, do you think he's going to attack his human nature or his deity nature to make him sin? Well, obviously not his deity nature, his human nature. That's why in his human nature, Jesus was hungry, thirsty, 40 days in the wilderness. Jesus Christ was not in his God nature eliminating the hunger and thirst. Jesus was on his human nature where Satan Christ took that as an opportunity to attack. Another thing is this. Look, if, if Jesus cannot sin, why would Satan even bother trying to tempt him? Okay, Satan's not stupid, folks. Satan's not stupid. He knows that Jesus Christ could have sinned, so that's why he... 
he did the trial on him. Now in James chapter 1 verse 13, God cannot be tempted to sin. In James chapter 1 verse 13. So that's why they're going to say, well, do you believe Jesus is God? Yes, I do. Then they're going to say, well, God cannot be tempted to sin. Neither tempteth he any man. But there's a simple flaw to that. That verse is focusing on the God nature. God cannot be tempted with evil. Doesn't that contradict Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 through 16, which you wrote before? But write this one down again. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. Christ was tempted in all points like as we are. Boom. But James chapter 1, verse 13 says God cannot be tempted with evil. So what's the solution here? That's why this teaching is important. It's his what? Humanity of Christ. Jesus Christ has two natures. Two natures, not one. When you have one nature, you're going to get confused. He has two natures. He has the deity as well as humanity. So we don't deny Jesus is God at all because of his deity nature. But in this case right here, it's his humanity nature we're focusing on. So if a person says right here, oh, Jesus is weak, Jesus got hungry, oh, Jesus can be tempted with sin, Jesus Christ says, why callest thou me good? Your simple answer to that is, yeah, those verses in context is his human nature. Then you're done. You finish answering the, the, their argument in less than 10 seconds. That's in his human nature. Where in this verse is it referring to his God nature? Tell them. See, Jesus was, focus, was not focusing on his God nature that time. Now remember, why would Satan bother to tempt him then in Matthew chapter 4? Not only that, why would Jesus Christ struggle to obey or disobey God's will at Luke chapter 22, verse 42 through 44? What did Jesus say? Let this cup pass from me. In fact, he sweated as it were great drops of blood. Look at that. He was struggling right there. He was saying, what should I do? I mean, he was sweating really hard that as if it were great drops of blood because he did not want to take the wrath of sin upon himself. So this is about the humanity of Jesus Christ. This is going to be very helpful for you against a lot of critics and arguments. All right, now we're going to talk about prayer. Prayer. So prayer is an important teaching. This is one teaching that you'd really want to uh, mark down. It's very helpful, prayer. Now, what is prayer? What is prayer? In the Bible, it is talking to God on four things, okay? Prayer is basically talking to God. That's what it means. It means talking to God based on four things. Four things. And you're going to see them in the Bible. This proves the definition of prayer. So if some little kid asks you, what does prayer mean? you got to give them a verse to prove it. So what you're going to find out is it, it means talking to God based on four things. Adoration. Adoration. Psalms 95 verse 6. Psalms 95 verse 6. Okay. This ink is like dying out on me. It is also based on confession. Psalms 32 verse 5. It is based on thanksgiving, Philippians 4, 6, Philippians 4, 6, and supplication, supplication, 1 Timothy 2, 1, 1 Timothy 2, 1, or, or, with supplication, or blessing, or blessing, 2 Samuel 7, 29, 2 Samuel 7, 29. All right, now the next section is how to pray, how to pray. This is how to pray. Now, this will be very helpful for you. This is where we get the idea, bow your head, close your eyes. Otherwise, why bother doing that, right? Why bother doing that? Unless there's a meaning and unless there's a verse behind it. Okay, first of all, you direct it to God the Father. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Acts 12, verse 5. So don't pray to Jesus. That's important to understand. You are not praying to Jesus. So you can't say, dear Jesus. No, you don't do that. You're not praying to Jesus here. You're praying to the Father. Where Jesus comes in is when you close it in the name of Jesus. Close it in the name of Jesus. That's John chapter 14, verse 13. John chapter 14, verse 13. How the Holy Spirit is involved is he communicates the channel through the power. That's Ephesians 6, 18. 
Ephesians 6, 18. Now, I've, I've seen independent, fundamental Baptist, King James only people, and their pastors and evangelists, they even mess that up. That's a basic doctrine. You're not praying to Jesus here. You're directing it to the Father. There are people who don't close in Jesus' name. you got to close in Jesus' name. Uh, you ever heard people just saying amen, but not in the name of Jesus? Amen. So that's, this is a basic doctrine, you understand. There are pastors who mess this up. Okay, you bow the knee. You bow the knee. Philippians 2.10. Philippians 2.10. That's where bowing the knees come in. Your face is on the earth. Face is on the earth. Genesis chapter 17, verse 3. Genesis 17, verse 3. You lift hands. You lift up hands. That's why we have the idea about folding or pressing our hands together upwardly in prayer. Because it's lifting it up to God. See that? It's lifting it up to God like this. So you'll see some people going like this or like this. It doesn't matter. But the point is that the hands, they're lifted up to God. That's found at 1 Timothy 2.8. 1 Timothy 2.8. You ever heard the idea of bow your heads, bow your heads and close your eyes? That's Genesis chapter 24, verse 48. Genesis chapter 24, verse 48. Where does amen come from, right? We pray, we pray in Jesus' name, and then people always say amen or amen at the end. That's based on 1 Corinthians 14.26. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Closing eyes. Why do we have to close our eyes? That's found at Luke chapter 18, verse 13. Luke 18, 13. Not only that, sometimes you can lift up your eyes to heaven. Lift up your eyes to heaven like this. That's found at John chapter 17, verse 1. John chapter 17, verse 1. Fasting. That's where fasting comes in. Some people want to fast and pray. 1 Corinthians 7 5 first Corinthians 7 5 now this is something extremely important there are times formalities are not required so where you bow your head close your eyes you don't have to do that all the time because you may be at a moment where you're talking to a family member and you're taking care of a family crisis you don't have time to bow your knees and put your face on the ground and pray you're gonna have to just pray real quickly in the head oh God help me like real quick in your head and then help out the family crisis in those cases, that's proven at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. That proves that formalities are not required. Okay, where to pray? Where to pray? There are spots to pray. Sometimes it can be a very important thing to have your own prayer spot. Where to pray? In the closet, Matthew 6, 6. Matthew 6, 6. You can do it in the closet. In the house of God, in the house of God, Luke chapter 18, verse 10, Luke chapter 18, verse 10, in front of the congregation. That's why we have people praying in church in front of the congregation. That's found at 1 Kings 8, verse 22 through 53. And this is a no-brainer. Everywhere, everywhere you pray. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. All right, when to pray, when to pray. What are the hours? What are the times? When should I pray? So here are some helpful tips. In the morning, Psalms chapter 5, verse 3. Psalms chapter 5, verse 3. In noon and evening. In noon and evening. Psalms chapter 55, verse 17. Chapter 55, verse 17. Daily. Daily. Psalms chapter 86, verse 3. Psalms chapter 86, verse 3. Day and night. Day and night. Psalms chapter 88, verse 1, verse 1. Thus the idea is, because you notice these times of the day, sometimes people will do three times a day, see? Because they'll aim at those hours, morning, noon, and then evening. Or sometimes they'll do morning, noon, and night. This is proven at Daniel 6, verse 10. Daniel 6, verse 10. <coughs> <coughs> Daniel prayed three times a day, three times a day. This guy was second in charge of all government affairs. You think he had time? He had no time, yet he made time. So the bottom line is, when do you pray? Always. That's the idea. You always pray. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. So it's not just three times a day. You got to do it everywhere you go. That's why we have a brother named Brother Chuck. He can pray from two to five hours a day. Do you know why? He just doesn't do normal prayer time slots. He does it everywhere he goes. He'll just pray in his head wherever he does things, like thank you, Jesus, for this and that. 
See, prayer is literally talking to God. That's the idea. All right, subjects for prayer. Subjects for prayer. Oh, well, I don't know what to pray about, Pastor. Oh, trust me, there's a lot to pray about. So if you don't know what particular things to pray about, I'll give you a whole bunch of subjects. Here's the best one. Pray for the second coming of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. I want Jesus to come back, man. So pray for his second coming. I don't get it. If you're a person who believes Christians go through the tribulation, how can you pray that prayer? <laughs> Jesus, come quickly. Jesus, come quickly. No, the prayer should be, Jesus, put us through the tribulation quickly. Put us through the tribulation quickly. But that's not the idea here. Okay, healing for the sick. Healing for the sick. James chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. James chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. Healing for the sick. Now, this one is really true. Leaders of our nation. Leaders of our nation. Oh, I don't believe in that. Well, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. Why is that, Pastor? Well, the reason why is so that we can live a quiet, peaceable life. That's what the verse says. Look, I know that our president, our government leaders, you can find crazy things, maybe get involved in strange rituals, Illuminati, whatnot, but I'll tell you one thing. Paul and Peter prayed for the Roman Caesar, who was killing Christians. Our leaders didn't go that far yet. Why would they pray for their leaders? So that they can maintain a quiet, peaceable life. Because if you want the freedom to worship God in church, pray with the brethren, knock on doors and street preach, which I'm sure you want, then you should pray for the leaders that the Lord will have them continually give us freedom. Think about it, folks. You wouldn't watch me online if we didn't get the freedom. Okay, if we didn't get that freedom. You notice the freedom getting taken away and censored more and more? So appreciate what you got. Pray more. Instead of cl complaining and whining about the government doing this and that and that, did you pray about the government giving us the freedom to post these things on YouTube? Sometimes people who just get stuck on the internet and get delve into conspiracy theories, they're like, no, I don't believe in praying for that, praying for that. Then they whine and complain when their freedom is taken away. Why? Because you never prayed for our government leaders. You should pray for them. That way they can keep giving us the freedom. All right. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 1 through 3. Longer life so you can bear more fruit. Longer life so you can bear more fruit. Daniel chapter 6, verse 18 through 23. Personal safety of yourself and others. Wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 5. More missionaries and ministries. We, when's the last time you prayed for those? Luke chapter 10, verse 2. Jesus said, pray therefore that the Lord will send labors into his harvest. Comfort, comfort. James 5, 13. James chapter 5, verse 13. Christians to be worthy. Christians to be worthy. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 11. That's why we pray for the spiritual state of our brothers and sisters. Those who are backsliding. Those who haven't came to church for a while etc. The salvation of souls. Salvation of souls. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 20. Resisting temptation. Resisting temptation. Luke 22, verse 40. Traveling mercies. You ever heard of that in prayer request before? Oh, pray that I have a safe drive, safe flight. That's proven at Romans 1, 10. Romans 1, 10. Leaders in our church. Leaders in our church. 1 Timothy 5, 17. 1 Timothy 5.17. Look, if you pray, if, you, if you've been praying for Barack Obama, but you never prayed for your pastor, I think there's something seriously wrong with you, okay? <laughs> so pray for your pastors, pray for your Sunday school teachers, pray for the missionaries, the evangelists, the people who raised you right, leaders in our church. Not only that, pray for our enemies, Matthew 5.44, Matthew 5.44, pray for our enemies, that's very important. Enemies have souls too. We want them to get saved. We want them to get saved. All right, conditions to prayer. There are conditions that's important to understand. Otherwise, the Lord is not going to answer your prayer request. So this one's going to be important to understand. There are conditions to prayer. What are the conditions, Pastor? You have to have faith. Faith. That's proven at... <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. 
and Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Those three passages prove God rewards faith, and whatever you ask, you should pray in faith. And if you don't, your prayers are hindered because you lack faith. Persistence, persistence. Luke chapter 11, verse 1 through 13. Just because you prayed about it, what, why didn't God answer? Because you didn't keep praying about it. Just because you prayed once or twice, that doesn't mean it's going to make the difference. Humility, humility. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Repentance of sins, repentance of sins. Second Chronicles 7, 14 and Psalm 66, verse 18. If you don't repent of that sin, God ain't going to hear your prayers, you got to understand. According to his will, according to his will. Matthew 26, 39, 1 John 5, 14. But why didn't God answer my prayer? Simple, because maybe that's not his will. So he has a different, a better plan for it. Forgiving spirit, forgiving spirit. Mark 11, 25. Mark 11, 25. It's important to understand that if you don't forgive other people, then the Lord, he's not going to effectively hear or answer your prayers. All right. Uh, living well in Christ. Living well in Christ. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, and John chapter 15, verse 7. you got to live holy and well in Christ. Without lust, without lust. James chapter 4, verse 3. So whenever you give a certain prayer request, is it because it's what you want, your flesh wants? James 4, verse 3. Excluding double-mindedness. you got to exclude double-mindedness. James chapter 1, verse 7 through 8. James chapter 1, verse 7 through 8. So in other words, if you have a confusion when you pray about it, like your mind is set for God to answer that prayer, but in the back of your mind it's like, well, I don't know about that, maybe not, or et cetera. No, you got to erase that. Magnifying his glory, magnifying his glory. Numbers chapter 14, verse 11 through 13. Numbers chapter 14, verse 11 through 13, as well as chapter 17, verse 21. Verses 17 through 21. Now, here's an important thing. you got to claim the verses. That's extremely important. Claim the verses so that his, your prayers can be answered. Numbers chapter 14, verse 11 through 13, and chapter 17, verse 21. Okay, there are wrong ways to pray. Wrong ways to pray. So this is important to understand. I've, when I was actually soul winning, there was a guy, when we were going to do the sinner's prayer together, the guy knelt on the ground and did his fingers touching just so, cross-legged. And I was like, no, that's not how it goes, you know. <laughs> so wrong ways to pray. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. To saints. You don't pray to saints. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, the saints are the ones praying, okay? You don't pray to saints. Yoga, that's a no-brainer, okay? You don't do yoga when you pray. Like those people, you know, who did their fingers touching just so. Plus, they weren't serious anyway to get saved, so it didn't work out. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through 45. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through 45. That passage shows that an emptiness of the mind is more open to demon possession. So I don't think that's prayer right there. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Prayer rugs or books or other materials, you don't use those things to pray. Because in that passage, it shows Nehemiah did not use some rug on the ground facing toward Mecca, and then he had to have some books or materials to help him pray. That's not how prayer works. Repetition, repetition. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. That's definitely not a way to pray because Jesus said when you pray, don't use vain repetition as a heathen do. So Catholics always do that. You notice they keep repeating words. The, uh, the emerging church movement, they're the ones who mix up New Age doctrine uh, with their church practices. Uh, Rick Warren promotes it. He has a thing called the Jesus prayer you know, or breath prayers. That's off. That's, not, that's the wrong way to pray. The best way to get God to answer your prayers is this passage. This is the best passage. Numbers, look at Numbers chapter 14, verses 11 through 20. That's how you can get God to change his mind. This is, Moses knew how to persuade God. So study this passage. That's the best way to get God to answer your prayers. All right, the last teaching is the Trinity. The Trinity. All right. So what proof is there for the Trinity. Isn't it paganism? 
So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It proves that there is only one God. So in order to prove the Trinity, you got to understand this. There has to be one God, but as well as three different persons. So this is a basic doctrine. Did you hear what I just said? This is a basic doctrine. It's a basic doctrine. You'd be surprised how many people know about the Genesis gap. They know all the conspiracy theories, and they mess up in this basic doctrine, and they'll talk like a Jehovah Witness, oh, that's paganism. So this is a basic doctrine. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, it proves there is only one God, one God. <clears throat> However, you see that the Father is God, John chapter 6, verse 27. You also see that the Son is God, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. You also see the Holy Spirit is God, Acts chapter 5, verse 3 through 4. So here's the question, why does the Bible say one God, and then you see these three different individuals known as God as well. That proves there has to be a trinity, where three different persons are called God, but then it says one God. Thus, three different persons as one God. So, are you saying that the Son is not a person? Are you saying the Holy Spirit is not a person? Are you saying that the Father is not a person? Are you saying that they don't have different communication, different tasks, different characters, different aspects? See, that proves there are three different persons as one God. I'm not going to do a debate on that. I'm doing just basic doctrine teaching for little, for little children and newborn Christians. I'm not doing advanced theology for some people who want to pick a fight out there. It's just ridiculous, man. Okay, now here's the idea. In the Bible, so we see right here that there is proof for a trinity. However, trinity, that word is not a biblical word. The biblical word is Godhead. It's Godhead. These are found at Acts chapter 17, verse 29, as well as Romans chapter 1, verse 20, and then Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Now, in these three passages, it's very interesting. The Godhead is taken after us in three parts, which is found at 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, body, soul, and spirit. And the Godhead can also be understood through creation as well, creation. The sun is made up in alpha, beta, gamma rays. Egg is made up in yolk, white, and shell. Water is made up of H2O, which are one unit of oxygen, two units of hydrogen. The shamrock is made up in three distinct sections, etc. So we see the Godhead is uh, shown, is pictured through body, soul, and spirit of man, as well as the creation as well as Colossians 2.9, all distinct beings are made up in one as Godhead. That is ultimate proof right there. Not only that, God is mentioned in plural form. Plural form. So what are you going to do about that? He is mentioned in plural form. There are so many verses to show this. Genesis 1.26, Genesis 3.22, Genesis chapter 11, verse 6 through 7. So if there are Jews who deny the Trinity, you can use Genesis. That's the first book in their Hebrew Bible. Matthew chapter 3, verse 14 through 15. The New Testament also showed God as plural. All right, now there are distinctions of Trinity. There are distinctions of Trinity. The Father is greater than Jesus, John chapter 14, verse 28. John chapter 14, verse 28. Thus, there has to be distinct persons. See that? John chapter 16, verse 13 through 14. The Son is greater than the Holy Spirit. The Son is greater than the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. That's definite proof that there are three distinct persons, not the same. So what me, must be understood is that the Son is not the Holy Ghost, nor the Holy Ghost is God the Father, nor the Son is God the Father. However, they are all the same God. That's why you have to believe in Trinity. Because, in other words, three different, but one God. That's what it is. One God, three persons. Trinity. If we believe only one God, then we throw out the Trinity. If we believe three different persons, then we throw out the Trinity. 
Cults, they all have a mindset that doesn't make sense about Jesus being the same God it, because there's a difference right here with Jesus and the Father. See, what they're doing is this. They're only focusing one God, one God. We're talking about Trinity, not one God here. Trinity, one God and three persons. It's like that study we talked about, the humanity of Christ, remember? These people have a one-minded mindset. We believe in rightly dividing. When you do rightly dividing, then things click. These guys are just mashed potato, milkshake, one mindset people. The basis of the Trinity. Okay, so why do we believe in the Trinity? Because these certain practices are done by the Trinity. Baptism. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The benediction as well, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. We do it to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The new birth, <clears throat> John chapter 3, verse 5. John chapter 3, verse 5. Prayer, Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Not only that, salvation, salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Now the Trinity, it acts in unity. It acts in unity. So this is ultimate proof how three different persons, they definitely have to be one God. You see them, you see them doing things distinctly, yet doing it in unity. That's Trinity, distinctness with unity. That's Trinity. In creation, you see the Father, Genesis 1-3. You see the Son, John 1-1. And then you see the Holy Spirit, Genesis 1-2. You see it in the incarnation of Christ, in the incarnation. John 3, 16, the Father gave the only begotten Son. Luke chapter 2, verse 11, Jesus Christ was born. Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the Holy Spirit conceived. You see that in the plan of redemption. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, for all three persons, you'll see that in redemption. You see that in salvation, Luke chapter 15, verse 22. You see the Son, Luke chapter 15, verse 4. And you see the, uh, the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, 13. You also see it in communion, in communion, when we take the Lord's Supper. The Father, Ephesians 2.18. The Son, 2 Corinthians 5.19. The Holy Spirit, Ephesians 2.18. We see it in prayer, in prayer. We discussed that in our last teaching just now about prayer. John 16.23, the Father. The Son, John 16.23 again. And then the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. We also see in glory, in glory. When we get our glorified body, you see all three persons of the Godhead at work. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, the Father. The Son is found at Philippians 3, 21. And then the Spirit is found in Revelation 22, verse 17. You also see it in the act of regeneration, regeneration. The Father found at Luke chapter 10, verse 21. The Son, Ephesians 1, 5. And then the Holy Spirit at John chapter 3, verse 3 through 6, 30. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 3 through 6. All right, now the, we talked about the Trinity acting in unity. Now let's look on the attributes, the attributes of God in the Trinity. The attributes of God in the Trinity. Eternity. So this proves, so you show your Muslim friend, you show those people that Jesus Christ definitely has to be God, and you show that, uh, Garner 10 Armstrong guy that the Holy Spirit definitely has to be God all three are eternal Psalms 90 verse 2 the Father the Son Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 and 18 the Holy Spirit Hebrews 9 14 omnipotent all power 1st Peter 1 5 the Father the Son 2nd Corinthians 12 9 the Holy Spirit Romans 15 19 omniscient all-knowing the Father Jeremiah 17 verse 10 the Son Revelation 2 23 the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Omnipresent, the Father, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24. The Son, Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. The Holy Spirit, Psalms chapter 139, verse 7. Holiness. Now look at this. This is definitely all God attribute here. So when your Muslim friend says, well, there's no way that Jesus is God. Where, where in the world? Where in the world? It's all over the Bible. They don't read the Bible. See, that's their problem. Revelation 15, 4, the Father is holy. The Son is holy, Acts 3, 14. The Holy Spirit is holy, Luke chapter 1, verse 15. Truth, all three, truth. 
John 7, 28, the Father. The Son, Revelation 3, verse 7. The Holy Spirit, 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. Benevolent, benevolent. The Father, Romans 2, 4. The Son, Ephesians 5, 25. The Holy Spirit, Nehemiah 9, verse 20. Communion, when we all communicate together. 1 John 1, 3, the Father. The Son, 1 John 1, 3. The Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. Thus we close our teaching on the Trinity. All right, your homework assignment will be given at the end of this video. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers, that we grow more and more in basic knowledge of the Scriptures. And through these basic knowledge of the Scriptures, we can better understand your word, grow better, and even understand more advanced doctrine as time passes by. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.